Before I start, I want to uh, call your attention to something uh, that has uh, just gone online. Uh, it's a website called On Power. Uh, that's one word, no spaces. On Power. Dot org, and this is uh, one of the projects of the Independent Institute, which I work with. And uh, it started out uh, a year ago or more uh, to be a website uh, connected with my book, Crisis and Leviathan, and other things that I've written on, on uh, related themes and topics. Uh, but uh, it grew, and it turned out to be about 100 times bigger uh, than we had in mind to begin with, and and it, it doesn't just deal with my work, uh, although much of my work uh, that relates to uh, the growth of government and uh, related topics is, is there, uh, uh, and a great deal of it is available in hyperlinks so that you can get access to the text online. Uh, but a tremendous amount of uh, other material is also listed there uh, and organized uh, in uh, subject areas, uh, things having to do with the uh, various uh, aspects of uh, government uh, policy making or action uh, according to uh, uh, different historical periods and according to different parts of the world. So it's really quite a comprehensive resource uh, for people uh, interested in tracking down uh, material, uh, the the reading list, which is in a sense what uh, what this site uh, contains, uh, are really marvelous. I, I I I look at it sometimes and I think uh, I, I only wish I'd read <laughs> more than a small fraction of all this material myself. Uh, and uh, I, I have that same sinking feeling I had when Murray Rothbard wrote that that letter uh, years ago. <laughs> But uh, there, there's a lot to learn, and uh, I'm not very far along. But uh, but this is a wonderful resource uh, in this area. Uh, I, I'd say it's uh, it, it's different in flavor uh, from from anything I know about. It's uh, it's it's quite similar, however, to to the flavor of uh, suggested readings you get from from Mises.org, and and has a great deal of overlap, indeed, uh, with many of the authors you find there. Uh, but uh, I recommend this to you. Have a look at it. Uh, see what you can uh, do with it. Uh, I think you may find it very useful, and, and especially if you if you ever should find yourself in that curious position of wanting to to track down something I've written, uh, if it's about the growth of government or a related topic, uh, foreign policy critiques, or uh, anything along those lines, uh, you're you're likely to find uh, the text online at onpower.org, so I commend that to you. Uh, this morning I want to, uh, to talk uh, about the 19th century and the growth of government uh, during, during that time. Uh, yesterday I put a, uh, a graph up uh, showing the, the growth of federal spending from, uh, I think, the very beginning, from 1790 or so all the way up to recent years. Uh, and one of the, the, the uh, uh, striking aspects of that chart is that except for the Civil War, <laughs> federal spending in the 19th century is always very, very low, runs 2 or 3% a year uh, at most, and it jumps up during the Civil War, but then it comes back down. And, and uh, so it, it looks as if... Uh, government didn't amount to much by that measure. Uh, what I want to, to do uh, today is to uh, look also at state and local levels of government because uh, they were actually much more important in many ways uh, so far as uh, intervening in economic life was concerned in the 19th century. And, uh, and also to talk about some of the ways in which the, the federal government uh, ha did play an important role, uh, but a role that doesn't show up in that graph because it do doesn't get reflected uh, in, in uh, the amount of money the federal government was spending. So that's the... Uh, the uh, topic uh, today, and then I'll, 
I'll begin uh, later on this morning to uh, discuss some of the ways in which structural changes in the late 19th century with the development of the national market and so-called big business began to change the regulatory landscape and and to create uh, some curiosities, uh, so to speak, in federalism. There was a sense in which I think federalism contained the seeds of its own destruction uh, under the conditions that prevailed then and later. Uh, and it's, uh, it's an idea that uh, I haven't seen discussed a great deal, but I, I think has some importance. Uh, I have some data here, uh, which are the, uh, the product of uh, uh, some very extensive research undertaken uh, by uh, Dick Silla and John Wallace. John was a PhD student of mine from the University of Washington years ago, uh, and uh, John Legler. And th these guys have been digging up information for many years. Uh, it's very hard uh, to find uh, state and local uh, budget data in the 19th century, particularly in the early 19th century, just literally finding it. Where, where is it? Are, are any records remaining? Uh, and then when you find it, making some sense of it and trying to organize it in a way that it can be made comparable to other information. Uh, uh, federalism was not a, uh, a system made with historians' ease in mind. So there's a, there's a lot of different jurisdictions to examine. But out of uh, all of this work, uh, uh, John Wallace uh, compiled these data. Uh, they're published a few years ago in a, a very nice sur survey article in the Journal of Economic Perspectives. Uh, and the national data are fairly uh, familiar because they're, they're easy to get and they've been available for a long time. But the state and local data uh, are basically uh, uh, information that was, was available only in rough guesses before. Now, obviously, these data are subject to some errors as well, uh, so I don't want to... Uh, uh, pretend that they're very, very precise, uh, nor would uh, Scylla, Wallace, and Legler pretend that. They're still working on this project. But, uh, but I think they're the right orders of magnitude, and they show us the correct trends. Uh, and, and, and they're quite revealing. Uh, you'll notice, for example, that when we, when we uh, are first able to look at all three levels of government here in 1840, we find that, that uh, the revenues of the uh, national government at that time uh, are a little, little greater than those of uh, local governments, uh, but not much, and, and uh, less than twice as much as the states are getting in revenues. Uh, and, and interestingly, as time goes by, uh, the movement is in the direction of uh, relatively more growth at the state and local level rather than the national level. By the time we get to the end of the uh, 19th century, uh, the local governments alone, the cities and the counties, are spending, uh, are, are, excuse me, are, are getting more revenue substantially than the national government. Uh, the states haven't grown at nearly such a high rate, but, uh, but they're not uh, inconsequential either. Now, to, to get some idea, the, these numbers are expressed in, in current dollars per capita. And, and, of course, we look at this and we think, you know, what a heaven. Uh, even if money had 20 times the purchasing power that it has now, uh, which is probably in the right neighborhood, uh, still, these are... These are, seem like negligible levels of taxation by modern standards, so, so it's uh, almost enough to make us believe there was laissez-faire after all, 
but when you look uh, at the far right-hand column uh, and you see these revenues as a percent of, of GNP, uh, yes, again, they're small compared to modern levels. Uh, the government's now getting uh, <clears throat> more than 30 percent of GDP in revenues uh, at, at all levels, uh, and that's a lot more than 7.2 percent, but but 7.2 percent is not nothing. Uh, governments were uh, out there, they were doing things in the 19th century, they uh, they, they, they weren't just uh, sitting on their hands uh, reading books on anarchism. So, so this is a, a kind of s overview of uh, where things stood at, at the various levels of government in the 19th century. Now again, uh, as I said, in the beginning uh, of the 19th century, the, the, the national government wasn't even trying to do very much, especially after Jefferson became president. Uh, the excise taxes that uh, the federal government had tried to collect in the 1790s were almost all abandoned during Jefferson's administration. Uh, there, was, there was an excise on salt at the federal level that remained in effect, but otherwise there weren't any until the Second War with England. Uh, and then they were only put in, uh, back in place for a few years to get some revenues to help pay for the war. Uh, so the, the national government got uh, its revenues uh, predominantly, that is to say about 80% or more uh, from tariffs, uh, and almost all of the balance came from uh, sales of land in the public domain. So, uh, you, I mean, it, it's almost as if that wasn't even a tax. At least you got some land in exchange for your money. So, so the, the national government didn't have much penetration uh, in a way that modern tax systems have. As in the 20th century, tax authorities uh, decided that, that you, you wanted to use the tax system not just to get revenue so that government could make purchases. You wanted to use it to affect behavior. You wanted to use it to, to, to penalize or refrain from penalizing different kinds of business and uh, different kinds of e even personal action. So that uh, nowadays, for example, uh, anti-smoking crusaders are gung-ho to, to place extraordinary taxes on cigarettes. Uh, you know, it's not, all of us here understand what a counterproductive notion that is because, in fact, when you put a high tax on cigarettes, as, say, New York City has recently, uh, cigarettes get cheaper because it stimulates all the smugglers to bring in cigarettes with no tax at all. Uh, and so, uh, strange as the idea is, nonetheless, uh, moralists and do-gooders and crusaders and social engineers and all the rest of the busybodies the world is plagued with discovered the tax system in the 20th century and so they they want to continually monkey with it so that they can make people do what they want them to do and, and uh, they, they don't seem to ever learn their lesson about the difficulty of accomplishing that objective. In the 19th century taxes were a little more straightforward. They were pretty much a way government wanted to get revenue. But not entirely. Even there, uh, when, when the, the federal government did go back to imposing excises during the war between the states, it, it put thousands of them on. It put them on everything it could, could, could think of where it might be able to collect them. And, uh, and after the war ended, it didn't give up all of them. And it's instructive that the ones it kept were the ones on liquor and tobacco because even in 1865 this country had its fair share of busybodies who wanted to dictate how their neighbors lived and uh, so in fact we've had that federal tax on liquor and tobacco continuously from this war between the states till today at the federal level. Uh, but that, again, that was an exception. At the local level, most of the 
ta tax <laughs> revenue came from property taxes uh, on real estate, uh, just as much of it still does. Uh, the states laid various kinds of taxes on, on people, but again, a relatively small amount of revenue uh, was acquired by the states. They didn't do much in, in the 19th century. Uh, they had you know, a kind of a long list of actions that they undertook, but none of them amounted to a very big deal in terms of the money required to carry them out. The revenue data don't tell us some of the ways in which states uh, became very actively engaged in economic life in the early 19th century. One of the important uh, avenues for that sort of activism was in banking. <coughs> Uh, you'll recall that the Constitution of the United States forbids states to issue bills of credit, paper money. Uh, prior to the Constitution's ratification, most of the states had been issuing paper money. And indeed, that issuance was a major complaint uh, for most of the founding fathers because they viewed that as a uh, as a way of cheating creditors. <laughs> and indeed, that's what it was intended to be. <laughs> uh, the states issued this paper money. Uh, you know, the first thing it did was cheat the people they owed. Uh, and then the paper money got out into circulation and was used to repay debts. Uh, and of course, depreciating all the while, uh, thereby uh, becoming a vehicle for the, the debtors to cheat the people they owed. Um, who had expected to be repaid, in, 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 in many cases, if not all, uh, in hard money. Uh, so this became a, a, a major issue uh, leading up to the Constitutional uh, Convention and the insertion of that provision against the state's issuance of <coughs> bills of credit. Now, <clears throat> as it turned out, this, the states kind of laughed off this restriction because almost immediately they started uh, getting involved in either establishing banks on their own account, that is, you know, socialist banking is what it was. So the states just set up banking institutions and started accepting deposits and making loans and investments, just as a regular private commercial bank does. Uh, so many of the states went into the banking business, Others, uh, although they, they didn't, or uh, even if they did, in addition to that, they, they became investors in private banking companies. Uh, and, of course, all of these uh, banks then proceeded uh, to, to create uh, uh, deposits for their lenders, uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 for their borrowers, and, and to issue paper money. So... If the Constitution said you can't, state of Rhode Island, issue paper money, uh, it didn't prevent Rhode Island from establishing the Bank of Rhode Island, which issued paper money. <laughs> and this kind of activity was, was rampant in the first half of the 19th century. Uh, it, it began to fade out around the middle of the 19th century, largely because these enterprises tended to go broke. Uh, they were, of course, badly managed, being public enterprises, uh, and uh, uh, failure was not an uncommon event in the banking industry anyhow, uh, so these were especially likely uh, to fail, and many of them did, and in some states uh, in the 1840s, uh, new constitutions were written uh, forbidding the states to uh, engage in uh, banking any, anymore. Uh, so that was one of the ways in which uh, states did play an important role uh, because the, the, these banks all, all acted as a kind of a crony capitalism. You know, your, your pals were the ones who got the, the loans, and, uh, and politics dictated uh, how these institutions operated, even uh, matters such as where they put their branches, if they had branches. You know, which county would get a branch of the State Bank of Iowa, for example? I, ha I had an interesting article a few years ago in, in my journal, the Independent Review, uh, 
uh, on some of the state banks in the in the uh, midwestern states that were still operating in, uh, in the 1860s, uh, some of them. So it took a while for this this sort of thing to be be driven away. Uh, uh, in addition, the states became heavily engaged from oh about the second decade of the 19th century in investing in transportation improvements, especially in canals uh, between about 1815 and 1840. <laughs> uh, and uh, in the beginning, uh, New York State uh, really showed the way uh, by building the, the Erie Canal, uh, which, uh, which linked basically Albany and Buffalo. And by virtue of making that, that link, uh, it uh, allowed uh, waterborne uh, trade to, to proceed all the way from the Atlantic Ocean to the Great Lakes, and via the Great Lakes to, to penetrate far inland, uh, farther indeed than, than anybody cared to penetrate at that time. So, uh, so this was really uh, a, a, tr a tremendous boon to the development of uh, that part of New York State, first of all, even before the canal was completed in, in uh, 1825, uh, there was a, a tremendous boom of settlement and uh, development of agriculture and industry uh, in the areas nearby the canal and then uh, the state built feeder lines uh, out from the main stem line uh, and so it uh, did a lot to to draw people and industry to that part of the country. Now the politicians in other states looked looked up at New York and said, "Ah, they're getting the jump on us," uh, just the way your politicians here in Alabama looked around <clears throat> recently. I take it and said, "Somebody's getting the jump on us. Let's throw some of our money at Hyundai." Corporation. <laughs> I noticed that sign when driving up here on Sunday that uh, Hyundai is building a big plant uh, the other side of Mobi uh, Montgomery. <laughs> now that uh, I, I told Elizabeth, you know, pity the poor taxpayers of Alabama. You know, Hyundai's not coming here by accident. I guarantee <laughs> they've been uh, subsidized to do that. And uh, and and this was a game that states. We're already playing uh, almost 200 years ago. They've never quit. They've never quit because this is a form of corruption that uh, state legislators and governors and uh, their flunkies get away with. Uh, it's based on economic fallacy, but it's a fallacy that the public uh, can easily swallow and continues to swallow, and so it, it's politically viable, and I don't see any end to it. It's just... Just uh, like this state of the weather, you know, tornadoes come sometimes, Hyundai comes other times. So, uh, <laughs> and they'll take credit for it when it comes. That's the, that's the bizarre part. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, the next thing that happened after the Erie Canal was built was that uh, several other states said, well, we got to do this too. Uh, New York is going to suck all the commerce away from us. Because it was indeed promoting the growth of the Port of New York, where a lot of this uh, uh, commerce from the West was brought down the Hudson River to New York and then, in some cases, exported to Europe or, or elsewhere. So uh, New York City was flourishing, and Philadelphia said, we can't have this. Uh, we're losing our preeminence, not to speak of money. Uh, and Baltimore said, we can't have this. Uh, and even, even some vagrant politico down in the swamps of the District of Columbia said, well, we can't have this either. We've got to have a canal too. Uh, and so they began to build canals of their own at public expense, uh, more or less connected to these port cities. Uh, and elsewhere in the country, uh, a number of large canal projects were undertaken also by state governments. Even out in the, the wilds of Ohio and Indiana and Illinois, uh, which was so far away you couldn't see it even with a telescope, 
uh, people decided they had to build a canal that would uh, that would uh, basically connect Chicago via the Illinois River and uh, eventually hook into the Mississippi River down in the southern part of the state, and uh, and they, they they started digging all these trenches and uh, using taxpayer money to do it, and eventually they completed some of them. Uh, as it turned out, none of them had the uh, effect that the Erie Canal had had in New York, uh, perhaps because they were too late. The Erie Canal had already, uh, in a sense, got its foot in the door of connecting uh, the Western economy, the one beyond the Appalachians. Uh, you'll recognize this as the Appalachian Range, of course, <laughs> here. Uh, and that, that was the problem for early Americans, <laughs> is that they all lived here. <laughs> Uh, on the east side of the Appalachians, which Easterners call mountains. Uh, I've never understood why, I, be, being a Westerner. But uh, uh, they were a big barrier in those days. And, and uh, once, you, once you got through there somehow, uh, you had uh, a means of connecting with a lot of potentially lucrative trade because that interior area was definitely going to be settled. Everybody knew that. It was just a matter of time and where uh, and when uh, the pockets of development would appear. So the New Yorkers got up here, and uh, you'll recognize these squiggles as the Great Lakes. And, uh, and once you got into there, you could go and then come down rivers or canals that were built in the west and have access to the entire area almost of the, of the old Northwest Territories, which is a huge, fertile, productive, uh, magnificent area uh, just crying out for land speculation. <laughs> and that was what Americans did above all else. Uh, you know, you can call Americans a lot of names, but basically what we've, we've been from the beginning is land speculators. Uh, and smugglers, yeah, well, uh, some of us didn't have access to water. <laughs> uh, these uh, investments in canals uh, almost all went broke at the end of the 1830s and the beginning of the 1840s. At the time they went broke, many of them were not completed yet, especially those out in the Midwest. And uh, they ended up saddling taxpayers with a lot of debt obligations uh, with nothing to show for it. Uh, and a lot of citizens became quite angry about that situation. And again, new constitutions were written in a number of states in the 1840s not only to keep states out of banking enterprises, but also to, to uh, prevent them from investing in uh, canals. And so it, it wasn't that states stopped uh, channeling money into transportation improvements. They didn't. Uh, they began instead to, to channel aid to railroads uh, about the same time, which were just getting rolling, as it were. Railroads were first built in 1830 in this country, and uh, it really developed quickly in the 1850s and afterward. Uh, and uh, every time a railroad passed through anywhere in this country, uh, the owners would prevail on every county, town, and city uh, nearby for some kind of subsidy. And very often they, they got it. Uh, one way they got it was by threat, by threatening to go somewhere else with their railroad line. Uh, and uh, towns, uh, even whole counties, recognized if the railroad bypassed them, then economic development was uh, going to bypass them too, uh, to some extent at least, and thus their land values wouldn't go up as much. Remember, that's what we Americans care about is getting that, that unearned increment, as it were, in Henry George's terms. <laughs>
So these, uh, these companies were continually playing off local governments for subsidies, and they got them in various forms. Uh, sometimes they got cash grants. Uh, sometimes they got uh, uh, guarantees uh, uh, that the state or the city or county would, would stand good uh, if the, if the uh, railroad company couldn't pay its debts on time. Uh, and uh, sometimes they got tax forgiveness, and that was pretty common, just as I'm sure Hyundai is getting a period of tax forgiveness, maybe in perpetuity. <laughs> oh, just 25 years, okay. Well, that'll polish me off. <laughs> so uh, so you, you, you could uh, engineer these boondoggles in various ways, and they tried them all. Uh, and that was uh, an important way in which uh, state and local governments got involved in manipulating the course of economic events in the 19th century. Again, a lot of this activity doesn't show up in the budget anywhere. Uh, if a county guarantees a million dollars worth of the Illinois Central's debt, <clears throat> well, it doesn't show up, uh, especially if the, it never has to make good on that promise. But it still has an effect on the allocation of resources. It determines how much gets used where, when, and how. Uh, so it distorts the market system. And indeed, the market system was subject to all kinds of distortions of this sort in the 19th century, even though, again, it looks like an era of small government. Uh, it, was, uh, it was an era when, when, uh, when, 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 when graft was, uh, was quite uh, well known to public officials and, and citizens, and uh, they engaged in all sorts of corruption. So those are just some of the ways in which states and, and local governments uh, uh, were bigger than we, we might think. Now, in the late 19th century, uh, as urbanization began to really pick up, and uh, many large cities developed in this country, uh, at that time, uh, you could no longer just let a city develop willy-nilly, or at least citizens didn't want them to develop that way, uh, with, uh, with mud uh, for streets and uh, no sidewalks and no lighting and, uh, and no sewerage and, and no water supply and what have you. So that uh, as cities developed in the late 19th century, uh, they, they were called upon. Uh, I think there was a legitimate demand by the people who lived there for this kind of infrastructure investment. And they, they proceeded to undertake it. And it was a massive amount of work uh, to, to build all of the, these streets and pave them and build sidewalks and put in uh, lighting. And, uh, and in, particularly in the 1880s and onward, uh, sewerage systems uh, and water supply systems. Uh, those are very big projects. Uh, they took a lot of investment. Uh, and so when you look here at the local government spending, uh, you see it, uh, it doesn't look at, uh, between 1870 and 80 and 90 as if it's really changed. Uh, it has because the price level uh, falls quite a bit during that period. So in real terms, it's going up. And then in the 1890s, it takes a serious jump because there's even more of that kind of infrastructure investment going on at that time and into the early 20th century. Uh, uh, those are the days when we began to get uh, drinking water that wouldn't necessarily give you cholera or typhoid uh, because <clears throat> cities began to install water filtration systems and, uh, and uh, so-called sanitary sewers so that they were properly piped and didn't uh, allow the sewage to get mixed up with the water in the, in the water pipes. And uh, we take these things for granted now, uh, but, you know, you, I can easily recommend places to you uh, where you don't, you don't take them for granted and, and you miss them actually when you're, when you're in a place where you can't drink the water and uh, you don't have a, a proper sewer system and whatnot. So uh, this was a big deal for local governments, especially for city governments. Big cities uh, did the whole range of uh, this kind of infrastructure investment. A lot of smaller towns didn't do it for a long time until well into the 20th century. 
Okay. Well, let us uh, return, as it were, to uh, the national government, the various national governments, and consider some of the other ways in which government in the 19th century was bigger than we might think. I have here a genuine <laughs> replica <laughs> of a $65 bill. <laughs> Any takers? <laughs> uh, this actually precedes the 19th century, but it, uh, but it makes a point. Uh, this, this was issued in, uh, actually in 1779 by the Congress of the United States of North America. And it, uh, it promises to pay you a 65 Spanish milled dollars. They weren't proud in those days. <laughs> they, weren't, they weren't afraid to promise foreign money <laughs> because everybody knew that the Spanish milled dollar was made out of gold and it had some value. So that's what they promised. Uh, now, this turned out to be quite quickly not worth a continental. Uh, but... Uh, the point I want to make is that uh, this, this is a, as it were, a piece of evidence of taxation because uh, the, the, the Congress and the, the, the Continental Army and other people it was supporting went out and exchanged these pieces of paper they had, they had, had printed up for goods and services. And getting the use of those goods and services constituted a tax because the people who got this in exchange, well, the first people got a little something in exchange, and next month after that, the guy who held this got nothing, approximately, because these things depreciated very, very quickly. And uh, by the early 1780s, they were worthless. So uh, the, the paper money issued by the by the United States and uh, by the various uh, states to pay for their Revolutionary War expenses all operated as a tax by creating worthless pieces of paper and using them to acquire real goods and services. So it's the acquisition of real goods and services that was the tax, and this is just the... the, the uh, bookkeeping, as it were, for that confiscation. I have another uh, genuine replica here of another national government from the 19th century. This one was called the Confederate States of America, and it issued this bill, or at least the one it's a replica of, on uh, February the 17th, 1864, at Richmond, and it promises that two years after ratification of a treaty of peace between the Confederate States and the United States, the Confederate States of America will pay to the bearer on demand $500. Uh, well, we're still waiting for that treaty. <laughs> we're waiting even more than the Koreans. You know, they, they've only been waiting since 1953 for their peace treaty, but... Uh, we're, we're waiting much longer for our peace treaty. <clears throat> so this, this was a vehicle of taxation. Uh, the Confederate States spent this money, and they got real goods and services in exchange. Uh, by this time, of course, the $500 uh, of this bill would probably, probably buy you about one potato, if that, because uh, the Confederate price level had gone up about a hundred times by then, or close to it. So this was uh, worth maybe five cents in gold. <clears throat> uh, but uh, it was still something, and they were still printing them like crazy, almost to the very end, and using them as a means of taxation. It doesn't show up. Of course, none of these data reflect the Confederate <coughs> States anyhow. It's as if, as if it never happened. But, uh, somehow disappears. So money issuance is another way in which, uh, in the 19th century, governments at least periodically laid claim to resources and affected the way resources were allocated and used. 
who got access to them, who was able to do what, uh, governments with the power to issue paper money uh, had something to do with that. Now, <clears throat> I have uh, drawn a uh, visual aid here, believe it or not. I sought a real map, but failed to find one this morning. So here we have uh, approximately the, uh, the continental limits of the United States of America. And the, uh, the point I want to make with this map is, uh, is uh, that it, it, it's a damn big area. Okay. <laughs> now, when the United States came into existence, as I said a minute ago, nearly everybody who lived here, you know, all four million of them, <laughs> lived right here within 100 miles of the Atlantic Ocean. I mean, literally, they were clinging to the coast for survival. Uh, a couple of hundred thousand people had gone over the Appalachians, and they were pretty much living the life of self-sufficiency because it, it was so expensive to go back and forth or carry anything that there wasn't any alternative. They couldn't really accommodate uh, serious trade uh, in, in, in 1790. But uh, when uh, the United States was created and when the uh, 13 original states ceded their land claims uh, to the federal government, uh, this uh, that would be the Mississippi River. The original area of the United States extended to the Mississippi River, and the states, uh, most of them, had land claims all the way from the Atlantic out to the Mississippi. And in the 1780s, they ceded uh, those claims to the government of the United States. So this huge area out here... Uh, came in, into the ownership of the U.S. government. Well, this is a magnificent resource. Uh, this, is, this is not the Sahara Desert. You know, this is magnificent territory as territory goes on the face of the earth. It had great potential value. Uh, once it had transportation access to the outside world uh, so that people could get goods in and out cheaply. And as I indicated a while ago, they set about developing those means uh, from the very beginning. So, so people began to move out there quickly, and uh, when they did so, uh, they, they needed to acquire uh, the use of land, and the land was all owned by the United States. So what it meant was that uh, the United States government uh, might not have had much money in its treasury, but it had something almost as good, which is it had ownership of a huge amount of land of great pot potential value. And so it began to use that land the way we think of modern governments using money <laughs> to reward its friends, <laughs> okay? to carry out projects that it favors, uh, and so forth. Uh, now, as I indicated yesterday, the governments want money to pay troops to kill people if need be. That's the short course in public finance. Now, since they didn't have much money and it was hard to, hard to get money to have any value <laughs> for this government, they used land instead. Sometimes when they wanted to hire troops on for some expedition, they were always going to conquer Canada again, for example, they, uh, they, they would promise people, as it were, look, sign up, and you know, when, when you get back, if you get back, uh, we'll give you uh, some land. And, and, and so every time there was a military expedition or a war, they would end up giving a land grant to the veterans and uh, setting aside sometimes definite areas in the West that were reserved for uh, the people who held these warrants, uh, allowed them a definite quantity of land. So this was a means of payment uh, that they could use 
for anybody, including the services of soldiers. And they did this over and over and over, uh, land grants to veterans. In addition, they made grants to states. Eventually, this whole area was transformed into states. Uh, and uh, as that happened, uh, these states became players in the political process themselves. Uh, I indicated yesterday, for example, that the land-grant colleges uh, of the 1860s were financed by the federal governments giving land claims to each of the states, so that even states which didn't have any uh, public domain, such as the original 13, uh, who never surrendered uh, control of their lands, still got a claim to land somewhere in the West. And then they could turn around and sell that and use the money to establish their own land-grant colleges so that, we, so that we get institutions such as Cornell University in New York a land-grant college, even though New York had no public domain. So you could, use, you could make land into a, a, a medium of exchange, as it were. You could finance schools. Indeed, in the original Northwest Ordinances, uh, designed by, written by Jefferson in the 1780s, uh, Every township, every area uh, six miles by six miles in the whole area of the United States west of the Appalachians, it was all divided into a grid, rectangular survey, uh, so that you knew definitely where every line of longitude and latitude was, and it was all numbered in a way that you could organize and keep track of. You could locate any parcel of land in the whole United States with precision. Uh, according to this rectangular survey system, it really was a magnificent uh, device for promoting settlement and uh, the privatization of this public domain. But uh, in, in every uh, township, which is six miles on a, on a side, uh, one of the sections, which is one square mile here, was reserved uh, for common schools, which is to say public schools. And so the people there could, could take that section, sell it, use the money to uh, pay for the local school. Uh, so that was built into uh, the land system of the country. Starting in 1850, the national government began to use land to, to subsidize major railroad projects. The first one was the Illinois Central, uh, which uh, brings us to the interesting topic of the President of the United States no one has ever heard of, uh, and that would be Millard Fillmore. Uh, has anyone ever heard of him? <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, this forgotten figure, uh, in my mind, is best, best associated with his signing into law the land grant to the Illinois Central Railroad in 1850. And this was the first of, of what turned out to be uh, many, many uh, scores of uh, land grants made by the federal government. And the Illinois Central uh, uh, connected, uh, in addition to having some spur lines, uh, Mobile, Alabama, and uh, Chicago. So, more or less like that. Uh, this has lots of interesting stories associated with it. It was a very big business. Uh, I guess at the time it may have been one of the biggest uh, enterprises ever undertaken uh, in, in various dimensions, uh, money and employees and uh, the rest of it, but uh, but it was a kind of boon to a lot of local people too. Uh, years ago, I, I, I met some historians in uh, Mississippi, up in Oxford, and they had been researching local court records, and they discovered that the farmers in the county where Oxford, Mississippi, is located for decades had a scam going. <clears throat> Which is, they would when 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 one of their old cows got to near death. Uh, they would haul it out and basically tether it to the railroad track. 
And then the Illinois Central uh, locomotive would come along and smack Bessie. And <clears throat> then the farmers would carry her carcass uh, <laughs> to the local court and sue the railroad uh, <laughs> for the lost value of their cow <laughs> and receive a very handsome reward by the local judge. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know how many counties were engaged in this, but uh, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't uh, begin to assume that they were the only ones who had figured this out. <laughs> <laughs> Mississippi's seldom the leader in, uh, <laughs> in thought. <laughs> in, in, in Louisiana, we have a saying. <laughs> that is, well, at least we're not in Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, sometimes people in, uh, write history as if these big corporations were just rapaciously running amok across everybody, and that's a misreading, because uh, from the very beginning, uh, there was give and take. Uh, the great capitalists and the barons were, were not just doing their bidding. Uh, uh, there was always a certain amount of resistance and uh, fighting back and, and uh, counter-exploitation, if you like. Now, the Illinois Central received about uh, two and a half million acres uh, in its land grant, uh, and it, and it uh, established the pattern for how these things would be done. And what would happen is that as the line ran along, uh, in the case of the Illinois Central, they'd go back for six miles, uh, and e every other section would be given to the, to the railroad, uh, so that on this side, uh, it was the second one and so forth, like that. Uh, and it continued that way all the way down the line. Now, the government retained all the alternating sections that weren't given to the railroad. Actually, uh, for, I don't know if it was constitutional purposes or some other reason, they actually made this grant to the states, and then the states made the grant to the railroad. So they uh, may have been a kind of little bit of Jeffersonian strict constructionism still operative uh, in the way they did that in 1850, uh, but I know later they didn't do it that way uh, in the 1860s and 70s but <clears throat> extended all the way down. So the railroad got all this, uh, all this land which it could sell, uh, and the other sections the government retained, and it sold. And the idea was the government didn't lose anything because the, the railroad's <laughs> construction uh, and, and the bringing in of settlers would raise the value, uh, at least doubling the value of the plots that the government retained. So they were giving away nothing. Uh, that was the, the logic, uh, if you like, of the, the way they gave these alternating sections. Now, in the 1860s, during the war, uh, they made a much bigger land grant to two companies, the Central Pacific and the Union Pacific, uh, which were built, uh, one of them from Sacramento eastward and the other from Council Bluffs, Iowa westward, and they eventually linked up in 1869 and created the first railroad that crossed all the way uh, across the United States. And the land grants they got uh, were 20 miles deep on each side of the track. Uh, later on, uh, the Northern Pacific Railroad got a, a land grant that extended 40 miles on each side of the track, with all the alternating sections uh, being given to the railroad. Now, uh, that, that turned out, uh, all of those railroads actually turned out to pass through some pretty worthless territory, and nobody ever wanted to buy a lot of those sections from the railroad, so they still own them now. Uh, a great deal of land is owned by the uh, Burlington Northern, which is a corporate descendant of the uh, Northern Pacific Railroad, and uh, a lot of it is uh, managed uh, in forests out in uh, Montana and, and Washington State, and, uh, and some of it still just sits there, uh, never developed. But at all events, these grants were used by the railroads uh, 
to uh, get revenue because they, they wanted to exchange the land for money, and they did sell a lot of it, and they, they promoted settlement so they'd have customers to use their railroad. Uh, and all the big railroads of the late 19th century sent agents to Europe to tell immigrants about garden spots like Kansas. <laughs> uh, the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe had these posters uh, showing Kansas. They <laughs> show all these orchards and vineyards and flowers blooming. <laughs> Yeah, you know, this poor bohemian guy, you know, he, he sees this he sees this poster. <laughs> Kansas, that looks great. Uh, next thing you know, he's in Wichita saying, you know, where's the orchard? <laughs> well, actually it, uh, it it worked out okay for a lot of them. Uh, there was an element of marketing run amok here. Uh, but nonetheless, a great many of these people, I don't want to pretend this was just a scam because, in fact, a lot of uh, people came to those railroad lands, bought them, settled them, lived on them happily, and were better off for it. So, so let's give the devil his due here. In addition the, to making the railroad uh, grants, the, uh, the uh, federal government ma made its land available to people who wanted to use resources there, even without their acquiring title to it. In uh, the 1780s, uh, something called the Timber and Stone Act was passed, and that, that was a, a law that allowed anybody to go on onto federal land uh, and, and, and cut down trees or, or take fallen timber if you wanted to use that for firewood or some other purpose. Uh, or take stone for building. Uh, so you could basically get construction materials without payment by just going onto federal lands and taking them. What year was that? Uh, that was a 1780, I believe, two. Uh, uh, I mean, 1872. I'm backwards there, 1872. Uh, and it, they also, in that same decade, passed a mining act. Uh, which allowed people to go on to federal lands and stake mining claims and exploit, build mines and exploit those mines and, and carry off uh, the minerals they took from them uh, and make them, appropriate them, sell them, make them their own. Uh, and indeed, that, that law is still in effect. <laughs> and it's uh, become quite controversial in recent years, uh, but uh, it's allowed thousands and thousands of uh, miners in the West to go onto federal lands and, and build mines and exploit the minerals there uh, without having to acquire ordinary ownership. Okay. So land was a big deal in the 19th century, very big. Uh, and it helps us to place in better perspective these budget data on the amount of money that the federal government had its, at its disposal uh, because it was able to accomplish a great many more objectives uh, using its control of the public domain than it was by using the money it got from tax revenues and to shape the way the country developed even. These uh, big uh, transcontinental railroad that were subsidized uh, probably wouldn't have been built for decades but for these subsidies. And uh, that means, of course, resources were being misused, uh, but it also means that the country developed differently than it would have had the market been left to direct where resources were used. Uh, sometimes these projects turned out to be reasonably successful afterward, uh, almost by accident even though market participants had evaluated them as bad prospects beforehand. Uh, but uh, that, was, uh, that was the exception to the general rule. And in, and in almost all cases, we'd have to say they were built too fast. They, they might have been sensible projects eventually, but not at the time they were subsidized and built. So we had uh, the government, even when it wasn't misdirecting resources in, in place, I was misdirecting them in time. Well, the uh, 
the war between the states I've mentioned several times, and I, I want to come back to it just briefly now, uh, because I, I've talked about how important state and local governments were in the 19th century and how they were becoming even more important in terms of getting and spending money. But <clears throat> that's, that's almost like a, a false signal of the way things were moving in the, in the federalism of the United States. Uh, because the, the Civil War, besides uh, establishing all kinds of uh, pernicious precedents for, for government activity in, in taxing and, and, and uh, spending money for, for uneconomic purposes and, and what have you, uh, changed the nature of the American political system forever. Uh, before the war, uh, the federal system uh, had real content in the sense that the, uh, the federal government could not just bully the states uh, whenever it determined that it had to have them do something in a certain way. And uh, we know that because the states eventually just wouldn't put up with even being part of the, the system any longer. And, and 11 of them seceded from it. So it couldn't just, just bully them, uh, but it could kill them. And so <clears throat> it's a, kind of like a Gordon Liddy's dictum, I, I like to repeat. Uh, Gordon Liddy says, uh, you can't kill an idea, <laughs> but you can sure kill the guy who holds it. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, they couldn't kill the idea of federalism, uh, true federalism, but they sure killed the guys who held that idea. And that settled the matter. Because uh, after 1865, nobody was really going to go out there and get killed by the hundreds of thousands for federalism anymore. That issue was settled here. Now, when no state can secede, states... Uh, are potentially, if not actually and immediately, uh, nothing but administrative districts of the federal government. Doesn't mean they have no autonomy, and indeed there's enough life left in federalism that its various kicks and twitches still make it uh, of some political interest e even nowadays, uh, but it's not the same system that it was before the war. Uh, then it was genuine federalism, uh, since then, it's been federalism at the pleasure of the central government. And as a result of that, uh, we've had the enormous growth of the government that I'll be talking about later this week at the central level. Uh, if we had still had the old system of federalism, it's much less likely that the course of events would have, would have taken that form, I think, uh, although it's very hard to say, uh, when we deal with hypotheticals of that magnitude, exactly what might have happened, but I, I'm sure things would have gone differently. So the Civil War did make a difference, even if it doesn't show up right away in uh, such data as revenue distributions. Huh? Now, starting uh, in the 1870s, thereabouts, uh, the nature of the U.S. economy began to cha change in ways that were politically con consequential. Uh, and, and I have in mind here the development of a national market and uh, the development of big business. Uh, before that time, uh, th there were almost no businesses in this country that employed more than a few hundred workers uh, and uh, very few that did business uh, far from home in several states, say. But as the railroad network was developed and as technological changes proceeded in a number of industries, uh, they had the effect of, of creating a potential for the realization of economies of scale. Uh, particularly in industries uh, in manufacturing that, that have uh, kind of flow technology, uh, things like uh, uh, petroleum uh, refining or steel making or flour milling, uh, 
or even, although the flow is uh, chunkier, uh, meat packing. Uh, <laughs> uh, in, in industries that, that had uh, a, a raw material flowing through a production process, it turned out that by increasing the size of the uh, batches being processed, one could lower the unit cost of production. And so every time, for example, they built a bigger blast furnace to make steel, it turned out that they reduced the unit cost, the cost per ton. And uh, this kept going for decades and decades. They just kept making them bigger and bigger, and every time they did it, there was a gain realized from doing it. And if you think about the geometry of it, you can begin to understand why that was. Because uh, uh, the volume increases faster than the uh, circumference of a vessel. And so, for among other things, you didn't have to have twice as much volume containing uh, a batch of steel uh, in order to produce twice as great an amount uh, of molten metal. So you kept building these bigger and bigger uh, processing uh, apparatuses, and uh, every time you were able to produce cheaper, and therefore to give customers a better deal than your competitors, which compelled them to adopt that large-scale technology. And, and in some cases, the market wouldn't support a whole bunch of large-scale producers, so the ones that didn't get there first uh, do, do so the smartest, uh, went bankrupt and couldn't meet the competition. So there was, in a number of industries, there was technological change, growth of large-scale production, uh, uh, shakeout of small firms. Uh, you, you saw this especially in the petroleum refining. In the beginning, there were, I guess, thousands of petroleum refiners making little batches of kerosene. And uh, by the end of the 19th century, there were uh, there were only a few dozen, maybe, uh, left uh, doing business, and most of them were are the property of uh, Standard Oil. So, so lots of big businesses developed. Uh, the first ones weren't weren't batch technology uh, operations, but they were the railroads. Uh, the railroads also turned out to be able to uh, realize economies of scale uh, by. Uh, operating widely, and starting in the 1850s, they began to branch out. The first ones were only a few miles, maybe 20, 30 miles from one place to another. Uh, and uh, in the 1850s, they built railroads from East Coast cities all the way out to Chicago. Uh, the Erie, the New York Central, the Pennsylvania Railroad, and the Baltimore and Ohio all connected an East Coast city with Chicago. And uh, talk about some fierce competition and some constant uh, uh, motive to cartelize. <laughs> uh, those railroads uh, had both. Uh, there's, a, there's a really interesting book by Paul McAvoy written uh, back in the uh, 1960s, I guess, on the uh, competition cartelization for the trunk line railroads, uh, the four I mentioned. And... Uh, it's quite fascinating because uh, he was able to study their rate wars and their attempts to cartelize, and and the, uh, the conclusion of it, of course, is that all of their attempts failed fairly quickly. <laughs> uh, railroads uh, having this large-scale attribute uh, and uh, often getting boiled down to a handful of competitors were trying to form pools and cartels and conspiracies of some kind uh, with great frequency, and, the, and, and they always broke down. And the question was, how quickly? Uh, now, you might say, if they always broke down, why do they keep trying? And what you want to remember is, is uh, Stigler's dictum. The short run is long enough to get rich. <laughs> so the motive was there. The incentive was there. They kept trying uh, there was actually a one railroad cartel uh, among some of the railroads in the mid-south, uh, upper south, uh, that seems to have worked fairly well uh, in the late 19th century for over a decade. It was run by a man named Fink, uh, of all things. And uh, Fink was much envied in the railroad industry as having been able to devise a scheme that allowed him to run a successful railroad cartel, at least for 
a number of years, but most of the time they failed. Well, not only in railroads, but in many of these other new industries with big business, uh, there were attempts to somehow suppress competition, which was normally quite fierce. Uh, and if there's one thing businessmen hate, it's fierce competition. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and so uh, they were attempting to find a way to suppress competition at the same time that uh, other forces were constantly uh, prompting them to compete. Uh, and, and in the 1880s, the lawyer for John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company uh, hit upon uh, an innovation, the trust. And uh, the trust was an ancient legal instrument which had been used to, say, set aside funds to support a, uh, one's children or grandchildren or to support some hospital or college, something of that sort. Trusts of that kind had been around for centuries. So lawyers knew about them. But trusts had never been used for industrial purposes. But this clever fellow said, ah, tell you what let's do. We've got all these, uh, all these competing uh, petroleum refiners, and we're driving each other crazy. We're, all, we're always you know, keeping anybody from making profit for long because we just find ways to reduce costs and lower our prices and undercut the competitors, and pretty soon nobody's making any money. It's just a treadmill. So let's get off of this thing. Let's get everybody together. How are we going to do that? How, we know that you, know, you, you get people in a room, and they all promise they'll, they'll hold a certain price, and the next day they're, they're cheating on it. They're making secret deals at lower prices to attract business. Uh, so how are we going to get around this? And uh, the trust device was a mechanism by which the owners of the separate companies handed over their, their stock certificates to a group of trustees, uh, and they got in exchange a trust certificate, kind of gave them a membership in the central group, the trust, uh, and, and, of course, by handing over their stock certificates, they'd lost their voting rights. Those came into the hands of the trustees. So uh, Rockefeller managed to, to persuade or intimidate or bully or, 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 or somehow uh, get every, everybody or a, a lot of the refiners to join the Standard Oil Trust. And at that point, the trustees were able to make unified decisions about setting prices, about restricting supply, about closing down certain high-cost refineries and diverting production to others where they could produce at lower cost. And this is known as rationalizing in business circles. <laughs> so, so this worked out pr pretty well, actually. Uh, it didn't mean that competition ceased because they never brought everybody into the trust. And, of course, even if you did, some new company could start up uh, so it, it didn't solve their problem once and for all, uh, but it did uh, move them in the direction they wanted to go, at least for several years. Now, other, other industries look, looked around and said, ah, this looks like a good idea. And so 12 or 15 other uh, trusts were formed similar to the Standard Oil Trust. Now, while that was going on, we've also got this just general growth of big businesses in various lines. And so people began to refer to the trust and to big business in general synonymously. So that it, 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 even if you didn't form a legal trust, people began to call your company a trust because it was this big industrial organization. Uh, and so the antitrust problem became... Uh, if not the biggest issue, one of the two or three biggest political issues of the 1880s. Now, the people who put up the most squawk about this were, of course, uh, the competitors who were suffering. 
uh, by virtue of the formation of big business, or in this handful of cases, the formation of actual trust organizations. And especially squawking were the butchers. In those days, before refrigeration, every town, every village, every neighborhood of every city in America had butcher shops. Because meat spoiled so fast, you had to slaughter the animals and use the meat right away. So there were butcher shops everywhere. There were probably hundreds of thousands of butcher shops in the country. And in the 17, excuse me, the 1870s, and, and, and especially in the 1880s, the big meatpacking companies in, in Chicago uh, and a few other places like Kansas City and, and St. Louis and Omaha uh, began to develop these mass production techniques to produce meat at very low cost and use refrigerated railroad cars to ship their product and keep it fresh. Uh, and they could ship it anywhere in the U.S. because a week was no problem. In a week, the railroad would take the product to the far ends of the country, and it would get there. It would be as good or better uh, than the local product and cheaper. So these guys began to drive local butchers out of business. Well, what did they do? In, in neoclassical economics, when somebody can't meet the competition, he, he disappears from the industry. But in real life, when somebody can't meet the competition, he appears in the legislature. <laughs> so they all appeared in the legislatures of all the states. And they said, uh, these uh, diabolical foreign trusts are coming into our market and driving perfectly decent people out of their livelihoods. We can't allow that. It's not right. <laughs> uh, now, the consumers weren't complaining at all. This was, antitrust was never a consumer-led movement. <laughs> never, ever. <laughs> uh, even where it has appeared in the past uh, 130 years to have consumers involved, it's a fake. It's lawyers <laughs> who pretend to be representing consumers. So it was always competing producers. And these butchers, because they were everywhere, were a political factor to be reckoned with. And so they showed up in the legislatures, and they got a number of states to pass antitrust laws uh, and, and, and health laws, things that said, for example, no meat may be sold uh, more than 24 hours after its slaughter in this state. <laughs> OK. It, I took care of the imported uh, product. Uh, or you could devise all kinds of other you know, pseudo-health uh, rules. Uh, this is a game that's still played. Europeans do this all the time to keep competing agricultural products out uh, of their markets. And the Americans do it, too. They, for years, wouldn't let Argentine beef into the country because it was said to be potentially infected with foot and mouth disease, uh, as if you, know, you couldn't check. Uh, or you know, leave it up to the consumers to take the risk if they cared to. But at all events, these butchers were a mighty political movement. Now, when a number of states began to suppress the competition of the big meatpacking companies, uh, these guys had some clout too. And so they began to lobby in the state legislatures. Uh, uh, but uh, worse yet, uh, it, it turned out that they, they could threaten that they actually would stop coming into the state. <laughs> and then that meant that a whole bunch of people who had d discovered they liked this product and wanted to consume it were in trouble again. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, furthermore, the, the business could just move out, you know, ab abandon the state and, and go somewhere else. And... Uh, States never like to lose taxable resources. So there were counter pressures uh, being put on by the big companies. And they, the issue was carried to the Congress of the United States. Now, we begin to see here what I referred to earlier today uh, enigmatically as uh, federalism containing the seeds of its own destruction. 
You've got all these states, and every one of them has regulatory power. So they use it. There's political hay to be made uh, by exerting their, their power, as uh, Fred McChesney uh, expresses it. You know, they use extortion. Uh, a lot of times when you appear to see business paying a bribe, it's not a bribe, it's a shakedown. State legislators or officials go to companies and they say, you know, pay us off or we will hurt you by the way we employ our regulatory powers. So when that happens, companies operating in many different states find themselves caught often at the mercy of having to comply with not only a lot of regulations, but different ones, which makes it very difficult for them to do their processing or labeling or even to decide how to construct their product. And so businessmen, always having the amount, amount of foresight that extends slightly beyond their nose, are always looking to put out the fire that's burning them at the moment. And the way they respond to, to being whipsawed by the different states is by saying, let's get one regulatory agency. And we can deal with that better, cheaper. Maybe we can even control it. <laughs> If not right away, then eventually. And this has happened again and again and again in American history. States, you know, we all think states are wonderful. They give us some place to run to when our own gets too onerous. And that's true. There's something to that. There is Tebow-type competition, as the economists call it. Uh, but there's also this dark side of federalism which is that it drives regulated companies to seek one regulator. And that, of course, is the national government. The government that, using the power to regulate interstate commerce, can, under the Constitution, uh, get away with regulating companies uh, who do business in more than one state. And so that's how we got uh, the, the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. It wasn't as bad as uh, some people think, actually, uh, because uh, the common law had been dealing with monopolies and uh, uh, restraints of trade for a long time, and judicial doctrines had evolved that were, that were not unreasonable. Uh, fundamentally, what they boiled down to was the idea that it's unlawful for you to take actions that keep somebody from coming into a market to compete, but otherwise, if you want to make agreements about how to use your property, even if you want to get together with other producers and set a, a reasonable price, you know, price fixing, that's also legal. We don't object to that in the court. Uh, in the beginning, uh, the idea was that all the Sherman Act had done was to codify the common law and to add the punishment that allowed treble damages to be paid to private plaintiffs who succeeded uh, in a case brought under that law for charging someone with conspiring or contracting to operate in restraint of trade or to operate a monopoly. Right? That language seems vague, and a lot of economists especially have looked back and said, oh, it didn't say anything, it's so vague, what does that mean? But it meant something at the time in the courts. There's a very good book by Martin Sklar, uh, even though Sklar is a kind of uh, uh, Marxist. Uh, he's an excellent uh, legal historian, and a big section of his book uh, deals with the evolution of the jurisprudence of the Sherman Act, and it's outstanding. I don't know anything that can compare to it. And it, and it explains that uh, until about 1897, uh, the Supreme Court continued basically to read the Sherman Act as if it was nothing but a codification of the common law. But in 1897, in a, a case called Trans-Missouri Railroad, it changed its reading. And at that point, it began to, to uh, act as if the Sherman Act had not codified the common law, but it overturned it and replaced it with a rule that required absolutely no price fixing uh, and, and 
uh, no uh, variety of other measures businesses might enter in, into to cooperate or, or act in a way that restrained competition. It was no longer read simply as, as having to do with keeping new entrants out of the market. Now, that created a lot of uncertainty for business at a time when big business was, was developing quickly. Uh, it, it made, among other things, big businesses uh, subject to shakedowns by uh, Theodore Roosevelt after he became president in 1901. Uh, Teddy, as you may re re remember, didn't oppose big business, only bad big business. That was you know, the big business that didn't play according to his rules. So he would even turn on his pals like Morgan and company and go after the Northern Securities Company that Morgan had formed in 1903, I guess it was, and had, had that broken up uh, without even discussing it with Morgan. Morgan was outraged. He said, if we had a problem, why didn't you send your man to talk to my man? <laughs> That's the way they normally took care of things in those days, and, and of course still do. <laughs> in some circles. It's called Trans-Missouri. Trans-Missouri. Uh, it had to do with a freight company. Uh, but that kind of legal uncertainty about the Sherman Act persisted until 1911. And in 1911, when the U.S. Supreme Court ruled on the uh, American tobacco and standard oil cases, which had been in the courts for years and years before a final decision was reached, the, the court announced what came to be known as the rule of reason. And that was a, a little more accommodating uh, rule in the sense that it, it, it said mere bigness is not a, a crime. Uh, and furthermore, there are reasonable kinds of contracts and arrangements that businesses can enter into, which may have the effect of in, in some way restraining competition, but they're not unlawful nonetheless. And furthermore, if you acquire... Uh, your uh, position in the market, even if it's a very large market share, by purchasing other assets, that's okay. So, if, for example, you just merged with a lot of other competing companies. That was not unlawful under the 1911 ruling. Or if you're just such a well-run company that you just got bigger and bigger and bigger and eventually you had almost all the market, uh, that also was permissible. So th this was a, a rule that gave more latitude to big business and clarified some of the uncertainty, but, but of course antitrust law has continued to be a kind of cloud hanging over uh, many business people. They ne never are quite sure when it's going to be used as a, as a club by their competitors to, if not to really uh, stop them, to ha harass them and, and make them expend a lot of money on, on lawyers. And uh, we, we've seen that again and again and again in the past century. So we got this uh, development of big business, national markets, antitrust law. And uh, in 1887, the first federal regulatory agency of any consequence, the Interstate Commerce Commission, which became more powerful in the early 20th century with amendments to the law and ended up... Uh, virtually setting railroad rates and other terms of service and pretty much ruining the railroad industry by the time World War I started, uh, at which time uh, <laughs> uh, the railroad system got so snarled up thanks to its, its previous ruination and bad planning by the war planners uh, that uh, the federal government nationalized the industry in 1917 and operated it uh, on its own account for several years before giving it back to the owners with many strings attached in 1920. So we're almost uh, out of time. I, uh, I've gone on a long time, but we have a few minutes for questions still. Yes? Um, regarding the railroad, uh, when was Amtrak created? What year? Uh, 70... 70, was it? 1970? Uh, yeah, around 72. So. That's about right. Early 70s sometime, I remember. Brad? Uh, these new state constitutions in the 40s mm -hmm. um, that were sort of in response to the wildcat banking and the, right. the, or the, the debacles, the, these, they, they uh, 
did they just get around the wording by giving subsidies directly to private business instead of having the state do it themselves? Is that what happened? Well, some of them just forbade the state to enter into enterprises. Uh, such as banking or to operate banks. They didn't, they didn't necessarily forbid subsidies being paid, and certainly not subsidies to transportation companies, because all the states have always done that and still do. So, so they just kept them from doing certain enterprises themselves? Yes. And, well, just in... They sometimes put restrictions also on their the, the, the indebtedness and the form of indebtedness, Things of that sort. Is that where we get today, where the states cannot have, um, the states can't run deficits like the federal government can? Uh, I don't know if that's the origin of those provisions uh, or not. Uh, I'm just not sure when they appeared in the state constitutions. But uh, I believe there's still a few states today that don't have that provision. I was under the impression until recently that they all required balanced budgets. Now, they've all devised ways to <coughs> escape that constraint with off-budget gimmicks and uh, with borrowing uh, of various sorts. But, uh, but it's still a, a, still a serious constraint for state governments because they can't get around it so easily as the federal government, which doesn't have any constraint at all of that sort. Some of those uh, state constitutions also prohibited private banks from issuing paper money, too. Like the New England state? Southern state. The, southern mm -hmm. state. the soundest banks in the country in the antebellum period were in uh, New Orleans. Uh, and although Louisiana did regulate banks to some extent, they were, they were not much regulated. They were just well-operated banks. And they issued... Uh, bills uh, that circulated widely all over the South, and I suppose many of you know that's, uh, that's why the South is called Dixie, because uh, Louisiana still used the French language in those days, and uh, when they printed, <clears throat> printed a $10 bill, it said Dix, uh, and to, a, to an Anglo, <laughs> it was Dix. So the area where these kinds of bills circulated around was Dixie. After the ten dollar French language New Orleans bank paper money. <laughs> do you think that had something to do with the, the way the law in Louisiana was structured differently than in other states? That the banks were more sound. Well, in part, it had to do with that. Some of the states still had pretty bad banking law, and some had uh, more regulation than others. Uh, it's very hard to generalize about state banking laws before the Civil War because they varied a great deal from one state to another, but. Uh, uh, but all of the states did, uh, to some extent, back away from conducting banking business. Uh, as I say, some were still doing it in the Midwest and after the Civil War even. Uh, I think uh, that was one of those activities that legislatures ultimately discovered that they could do better by using indirect means rather than direct means just as they did when they adopted general incorporation laws rather than passing a special act of the legislature every time they created a corporation. It eventually just got to be a, a hassle uh, because thousands and thousands of guys were coming into the legislature wanting to form a corporation and they didn't want to be bothered anymore. So they uh, eventually all the states passed laws which set general conditions for conducting corporate business and all you had to do is fill out the forms and pay a usually nominal fee and, and, and you were off and running. This is before the corporations <coughs> became big business? Uh, in most cases it was. The earliest general incorporation acts were, were in the second decade of the 19th century and I think by about 1880s all the states had some form of general incorporation uh, in effect. Uh, I myself am a corporation now, but you know, only to kind of jack up my self-esteem. <laughs> An S corporation in my case. I'll let you figure out what the S might stand for. Yes, sir. The, uh, when, you have, when you have a bank, you can sit there and say, okay, you can be in business, but you have to use my bond and reserves it, it becomes 
pretty good to have lunches and lunches in those banks. Yeah, that's true. That that was the the actually the sole reason for the creation of the national banking system during the war between the states. Uh, because those banks were required by law to hold a certain issue of U.S. bond as, as reserves. That's how their reserves had to be held, and, and uh, that meant there was an automatic market created for, for U.S. bonds. And that was the only reason they created that system. It had nothing to do with a uniform currency or any of the publicly proffered excuses for it. It was just another way that uh, the union government tried to float debt. Okay, thank you, Bob.